Dartmoor, full of ancient history, incredible flora and fauna, fairy tale rivers and valleys, high tours just brimming with character and story. And there is also a hidden side to the moor, because it is also a place of mysteries and mythology, folklore, ghosts and pixies. In previous episodes, I have talked about the strangeness of Dartmoor. It is a place my husband and I know well. We lived very close to the moor for many years, and part of Mark's heritage is from there, a farming family. And like with many other folk who visit the moor, it is a place that draws us back again and again. The tales of Dartmoor are many and varied, and today I am going to tell you some true tales of moorland pixies, or pisky folk, a tale of one of Dartmoor's many witches, and two stories of love found and lost. The hauntings and mysteries of these two tales have echoes even to the present day. So, make yourself a cup of your favourite beverage, get comfortable and let me tell you my first tale. Once there was an honest moorland woman who was making her way home. Night was drawing in around her as she came to the small bridge at the Ockery. The bridge spans the Blackerbrook at this place found between Princetown and Two Bridges. As she walked close to the bridge, something strange caught her attention. It was a small figure around 18 inches tall and it leapt into the road in front of her. The little creature jumped and frolicked towards the stream seemingly completely unaware of the Dartmoor woman. So what should she do? Should she carry on her way home or turn round and flee in the other direction? She trembled at the fear of being pixie-led over the moor, losing direction and senses and wandering lost because of pixie magic. However, she knew her family at home were waiting for her and they would be worried so she decided to be brave and carry on. But knowing how to deal with pixie magic of being pixie led, she turned her pockets inside out first so the mischief would not work. By now, the small fellow was right on the bridge, leaping from side to side to stop her from passing by. But she found some more bravery and walked straight towards the pixie. This strange creature carried on leaping and jumping, and this time it was coming towards her. With the single thought that she would not be pixie-led, but would take charge of the whole affair, she reached quickly down, grabbed the pixie, shoved it into her basket, and shut and locked down the basket cover. The pixie might have been still now, but instead, it started talking in a strange gibberish language at such high speed she understood nothing of course and if it was trying to frighten her this time it did not work. She was determined to get back home. Eventually the pixie was silent. Maybe it had fallen asleep or was sulking in the basket. With silence all around her the woman decided to take a quick peep at the fairy creature, carefully unfastening the lid and opening it just the tiniest bit. But the basket was completely empty. The woman thought long and hard about this and over time had the idea that the little fellow must have been able to shapeshift to a size so small it had actually squeezed through the woven wickerwork of the basket. And although she did not have her prize anymore, from that day forth she was known as the woman who had captured a Dartmoor pixie. There is a pretty Dartmoor village to the southeast of Dartmoor called North Bovey, with a village green, an ancient stone cross, a pretty church and a typical village pub. Absolutely everything that one would expect from a quintessentially English village really. And yet, 
North Bobby has a rather dark past. In the form of a witch, a witch who was known as the Toad Woman, and it is said that descendants of this woman still live in the village to this very day. The other name she was known by was Widow Anne. She lived on the edge of the village, her small cottage virtually falling down around her, and as with all cunning folk, wise folk and witches, she served as help for any villager who dared to come near to her cottage. She was the last resort after all else had failed. The villagers were terrified of her, but needed her at the same time. She was known as a clever spellmaker and healer, but as in all things in life, there would always be a price to pay. She cured many folk of the warts and toothache and minor ailments from gathered herbal remedies that could help those in pain. And yet, as with all tales of witches, there were those who believed that she could exact vengeance upon anyone who crossed her in some way. They would have a curse placed upon them by Widow Anne. Of course, gossip spreads and stories grow over retelling, but one thing is certain. Anne used toads to carry out her spells, hence the Toad Woman. Anne had many toads, it was rumoured there were 15 in all, and these she kept in a huge earthenware pot, a steam, and the pot and the toads were kept hidden underneath her dresser. The gathered tale of Widow Anne gives the name of some of these toad familiars. There were Croppy, Rumbo and Krant. Krant was the largest and most terrifying creature of all the toads. These toads aided Anne in her curses and spells, although no one knew how. These things are between the witch and her familiars alone. The villagers knew all about the steam though, and they were terrified of it. Any person who came to Anne for help, she would smile at slyly and tell them, touch the steam. If they did this, she would help them. And yet many a once brave villager ran from the cottage in terror at even the thought of merely touching the jar. Another form of magic Anne would use was a technique called the Bible and the key. In this method, Anne would place her door key in the pages of a Bible. Just the turning end of the key would be left peeping out, and then she would bind the Bible tightly shut with a length of cord or fabric. Using the little key poking out from the pages, Anne would lift the Bible and place it on its edge on the table. If the Bible stayed still, Anne knew the power of the devil was not with her enough to proceed with her spell weaving. However, should it turn, then it was the perfect time to perform her magic. Now the steam would be brought from under the dresser, the toads would be emptied from the jar to carry out her mischief, even hopping over the Bible itself to empower the spells. There was another tale told of Widow Anne by the villagers, that she was a necromancer. On dark Dartmoor nights, when that ghostly mist hangs over all, and damp is in the air, and when more powerful aid was needed for her magic, she could be seen making her way stealthily to the churchyard in the village. No one dared follow to see what was happening, because surely the devil himself would appear and take them body and soul. Yet the chanting and the screeching of Widow Anne and the unnaturally loud croaking of the toads could be heard coming from the graveyard as she wove her curses and spells. How peaceful North Bobby looks today, how innocent, and yet it's worth remembering should you ever visit there, that once there was a witch and her familiars, and the legacy of that dark magic may remain there still. There are two very sad and ghostly stories of tragic women that I will tell you of, and the first is probably the most famous woman of Dartmoor, the tale of Kitty Jay and Jay's grave. If you should travel on the very picturesque small road leading from Houndtall towards Batworthy and thence towards Chagford or Ashburton, there is an ancient green lane on the left-hand side. Where the two roads meet, 
there is a very peculiar sight. A raised grave with a small headstone and strangely always with flowers and offerings. This is the grave of Kitty J, buried at a crossroads in unhallowed ground for the crime at the time of her death of taking her own life. She was born in the late 1700s, an orphan baby abandoned at the poorhouse in Newton Abbott, nameless and alone. The child was given a surname in the register they had reached the letter J, and so J it was for her first name they chose Mary. Orphaned Mary lived at the poorhouse for years, taking care of the younger children until she reached an age where she could be found work and sent into service. She was found a place at a farm on Dartmoor, either Canner or Ford Farm, just outside the village of Manerton. Her job would be to help with all work, both in the fields and in the farmhouse. And it was desperate work, hard, cold and damp. As was the attitude of the time, workers' human rights were nothing. These poor apprentice young souls had little food, scant clothing and yet they laboured until they dropped. It is probably at this time that Mary became known as Kitty. It was a common practice in the days of servants to rename the staff with names chosen by their employers, a dehumanising practice taking away the individuality of a person, their life before meaning nothing to the keeper of servants. There are two versions of how Mary or Kitty met her misfortune. In one she was attacked, taken against her will, too weak to fight. In the other the farmer's son, as was common also in those days, took a liking to Kitty and he wooed her. She, poor Kitty, never having known love or affection, must have been swept away, a chance of feeling cared for, of being validated as a person. And as in so many of these tales of above and below stairs, Kitty fell pregnant. As in all the tales of this type, she learned the cruelest way that she meant nothing to her lover, and even less to his family. To his family, she was a wanton temptress, twisting their beloved son around her finger and plotting her future. Kitty was thrown out of the farm, homeless. Gossip was already spreading over the moor that she was with child. Nothing more than a fallen woman, cheap and easy. She knew only too well her life was ruined by her own innocence and gullibility. She had been so easily led. She would never find work in that area again because no one would want her near them. She could return in disgrace to the poorhouse in Newton Abbott shame upon shame being heaped upon her. Instead, she chose the most drastic and tragic act. Mary took her own life. Farm workers found her in one of the barns at the farm where she had hung herself. It was the cruelest of customs back in the day to not allow those who had taken their own lives to be buried in a churchyard. Instead, they would be interred in unhallowed ground. And as was the custom, this would usually be at a crossroads. The spirit of the deceased, who apparently would be denied a place in heaven, could return as a ghost to haunt the area, or even families who had done them wrong. And so to bury the body at a crossroads, often with a stake through the heart, would deny the spirit the ability to do this. This soul would be trapped in a liminal space between roads, not able to take a path one way nor the other. And this was the sad fate of Mary, Kitty. Even in death she would be persecuted. A spot was chosen and a grave dug. Without ceremony, she was left there upon the moor. And yet Mary's story did not end there. Indeed, the strange happenings started not too long after her burial. A dark, ghostly cloaked figure could be seen on moonlit nights, head bowed and face buried in its hands, as though sobbing. Who was this figure? Some said it was the ghost of one of those who had driven Mary to take her own life, 
and yet others that it was the son of the farmer whose eternal punishment was to return nightly to the grave to stand vigil over Mary and their unborn child. It was reported in 1890 by Dartmoor folklorist and historian William Crossing that the grave had previously been exhumed and bones were actually found, including a human skull. The man who opened the grave site was one James Bryant from Hedge Barton nearby and in 1901 it was revealed that the doctor who examined the bones was a Dr J W Sparrow and he was the son-in-law of Bryant. After examination they placed the bones in a box and carefully reburied them at the grave site, raising the grave to its present height and setting in place a headstone. In the 1970s the Dartmoor National Park Authority placed slabs around the grave site to protect it from grazing cattle and sheep. The other and quite beautiful mystery that surrounds the grave of Mary or Kitty J is that from the earliest of times fresh flowers have always appeared on the grave and yet no one ever saw who placed the flowers there. There was a rumour and some say that it was Beatrice Chase, the Dartmoor eccentric and writer, yet even after her death the flowers continued to be found there. Tradition also says that it's the work of the Pixies who vowed to tend to the poor girl's grave, and yet who knows. What is true though is that to this very day that the memory of Mary is looked upon with much kinder eyes and softer hearts, flowers still appear on the grave, and almost all who visit Jay's grave, including my husband and I, leave flowers or a small offering at her resting place. It is actually a truly haunting and yet beautiful area for such a tragic loss. And what of the cloaked dark figure? Well, that strange ghostly apparition is still sighted to this very day. Not too far from Jay's grave is the moorland town of Chagford. This is a place very dear to both of us and so many of our friends live there. It is an ancient and very artistic town, proud of its heritage of one of the stannery towns of Dartmoor. Tin was brought here and given the stamp of approval to be sold. The granite buildings and tiny cottages stand solidly upon the earth here. The quaint marketplace with its central building known as the Pepper Pot marking the often bustling centre. And to the side is a pretty churchyard where the 15th century church of St. Michael the Archangel sits surrounded by old gravestones and then cottages and many wildflowers. Inside the church there is a peculiar inscription on the floor. Here lieth Mary, the daughter of Oliver Widden Esquire, who died the 11th day of October Anno Domini 1641. Reader, wouldst thou know who here is laid? Behold, a matron yet a maid, a modest look, a pious heart, a Mary for the better part. But dry thine eyes, why wilt thou weep? Such damsels do not die, but sleep. So who is Mary, and what is her story? And bear in mind, this is definitely a true story not just folklore. Descendants of the Widdens and Mary still live in and around the moor to this very day and even place names and houses bear the names of the folk in this tale and the families have all been thoroughly researched. In 1641 Mary Widden was the daughter of a prosperous family in Chagford, a favourite child, young and very pretty all her life ahead of her. Despite the happiness of her family, England was in turmoil. Not a year would pass before the civil war would erupt, families turning against each other, brother against brother, loved ones torn apart in their support for either the King or Parliament, the Cavaliers or the Roundheads. The atmosphere of broiling tension 
provided the undercurrent of Mary's story. And yet, at this time in 1641, she was a carefree young woman and light-hearted with it. Mary's family lived at Widden Park House, what's now a deer park on the outskirts of Chagford, and her father also owned Widden House in the centre of Chagford that is now known as the Three Crowns Hotel. Her parents were Oliver and Margaret, and she had an older brother called Roland and an older sister, also called Margaret. Her grandfather was one of the first settlers who tried to make his home in the United States of America. Her great-grandfather was a noble at the courts of Henry VIII, Mary I and Elizabeth I. They were indeed a very highly thought of family. Mary was beautiful and as such had no end of admirers. In the legend, a former suitor asks for her hand in marriage and she refuses as she had already found another beau and they were planning on marrying, the date to be the 11th of October that year. The man who had been jilted took all of this very hard. He still loved her and began to hate her and if he couldn't have her, he was heard to tell anyone who would listen, then no man would. The folk didn't take him so seriously though, it was all bluff and bluster. Once the wedding had taken place, surely he would calm down and stop being so belligerent. The day of the wedding arrived. Mary arrived in her carriage, looking as beautiful as a Dartmoor summer day. The townsfolk had gathered to watch this daughter of the parish arrive, and they cheered when they saw her. Inside, her groom was waiting, with nervous excitement. The love of his life was to be his wife. The assembled families, all gentlefolk of the area and nobles of the moor, were in the pews, full of emotion as the young couple took their vows, exchanged their rings and kissed, the seal of a loving marriage to come. All of their lives were ahead of them. They turned and made their way along the aisle, passing more family and friends, back to the door to the steps, where Chagford and the world and the future awaited them. And then a single shot rang out, and a plume of smoke rose in the cold autumn air. A single shot that changed history forever. Time stopped. Confusion split the atmosphere. Mary crumpled to the floor and into the arms of her husband. Blood began to stain the white of her bridal gown, and a small hole was just where her heart was once beating. Her husband pulled her into his arms and from that day forwards, the families would never be the same again. And so Mary's tomb declares that she died a matron yet a maid, married and yet still a virgin. No one knows what happened to the jilted lover, nothing is recorded. Although the parish marriage registers have been lost to time, Mary's will does still exist, and in this she bequeathed money to her sister and her brother, her godchildren, the poor folk of Chagford, the labourers of the parish, and left a gold ring to her mother. And her family, trials and tribulations brought about by the fracturing of the families during the Civil War is well recorded in many documents. Yet this is not the end of the story. The spirit of Mary has been seen in and around Chagford, the place that she loved. In 1971, wedding guests staying at Mary's former home of Widden Park, where one of the daughters of the house was due to be married at St Michael's Church. On the very morning of the wedding, the guest woke and found a ghost of a young woman standing at the doorway to his room. This ghost was dressed in a very old-fashioned wedding gown. The spirit of Mary also frequents the Three Crowns Hotel. She wanders the corridors and also the Bishop's room. And there is said to be a tunnel linking Widden Park House and the Three Crowns, perhaps one used in the distant past by Mary. 
It is widely believed that the tale of Mary Widden was the inspiration of R.D. Blackmore's book Lorna Doone. Indeed, he did visit Chagford often, so this does seem very likely. In a most beautiful memorial to this young woman of Dartmoor, new brides will always place a flower from their bouquet upon the tomb of Mary after signing the register to ask the blessings for a happy marriage. Mary's legacy lives on. And finally, let's have another of the many Dartmoor pisky tales, this time from a long, long time ago and from the very beautiful village of Widdicombe in the Moor. In the village, there once lived a teacher. He was strict and rather pedantic, crippled also, sadly, and his name was John Norrish. His home was Dunstan Cottage near Widdicombe, and this was also where he had his school. He was, as I have said, a strict teacher. Many a poor moorland child would be on the receiving end of John Norrish's birch cane. And yet, despite this, he was an honest man. The moorland children were of desperate need of basic education, and although John Norrish himself had but little learning, he was determined to teach what he knew to the children only for a very small fee, or nothing at all if the family was too poor. This was not an easy life for John and his wife Nanny. They were poor as church mice. However, his wife was strong and she was sound, what we would call a hard grafter. It was Nanny Norrish who made sure that there was food on the table. Nanny Norrish was a travelling washerwoman. This is no mean feat on Dartmoor, as the roads were poor and the lanes back then non-existent. She must have been quite a formidable woman indeed. She would travel the moor to her clients at large farms and manor houses, scrubbing and washing up to elbows in suds and dirty clothes. And she was indeed a hearty older lady, cheery despite the hard work and poverty. She always had a smile and a great determination. She would stay longer to finish the washing so it was perfectly done, not leaving until it was mangled and spread to bleach and dry on the many gorse and furze bushes used for such in those distant days. Then, after a small meal and payment of course, she would begin her long walk back to Widdicombe. Whether summer or winter it was the same, Nanny was one of a kind. Many times her friends and neighbours would ask her in hushed tones, was she not afraid of the pixies? Was she not scared that she could be pixie-led, lost on the moor after one of their many spells? There was even a time when she was home much later than expected, and her husband John had been worried to death that the pixies had taken her, led her astray, and that she was lost on the moor. But she only laughed at her friends, and also at her husband John. Pixies indeed, what nonsense. She had never seen one in all her travels, and she had no time for the idea of them. And so Nanny Norrish carried on the same, until one day. Nanny had been working at a farm called Dockwell, quite near Widdicon. She bundled her own things together, tied up her clothes tight against the chill and bade the family farewell. They called back to her and warned her not to get pixie led on the way home. Don't be led away by the pixies. Nanny rolled her eyes. She called back. She didn't believe that any of them lived on the moor anymore, even if they did at all. She wouldn't believe in them unless she saw one with her own eyes and that was the end of it. Off she walked, heading home. By now the stars were twinkling in the black skies above her. Her heart was happy. She would actually be home sooner than she had expected, and husband John would be happy too at that. What Nanny Norrish didn't know, however, was that all her scoffing at pixie talk had been overheard by strange little ears and discussed by strange little voices. And so far, they had simply waited and listened. But this time, Nanny Norrish 
had gone too far. She had actually said that pixies did not exist. Enough was quite enough. It was time to teach old Nanny Norrish a lesson. As Nanny was walking lost in her own thoughts, she began to hear a strange noise, a chattering and a chittering, as though many voices were close by her and it was getting louder and louder. She stopped and her jaw dropped. In front of her was a huge crowd of little creatures, small people standing balanced one upon another, forming a great pyramid of little bodies. The living pyramid was a height that was virtually impossible and all the while chattering and chittering. Oh yes, Nanny Norrish had met the pixies all right. Nothing was said of how Nanny got home. We presume safely as she did carry on with her work. However, I don't think she ever disrespected the pixies again. And so there we have another Dartmoor episode. It really is such a strangely folkloric place. Please click like if you enjoyed this episode and please do consider sharing and telling your friends about it and please do subscribe. Little by little the community is growing and we are both very grateful for all the support and kind words we have had so far. Thank you very much. So, until next time dear friends, keep well brightest of blessings and remember, don't play with the fairy folk or you may end up in one of my folk tales yourself.